Hello everybody and welcome to this month's specifying practice group. Um, with that, I want to hand it over to David Lewis to get started with today's call. Um, and if any other questions come up, just let me know with you raising your hand or entering them in the chat box. Thanks. David Lewis, over to you. Thanks very much, Matt. This is Dave coming to you from New Jersey. I'm back in the office again this month, so hopefully we have uh, no difficulties like Matt was experiencing with all of the ice storms on the western side of Pennsylvania or Philadelphia. So I'm glad you made it through that, Matt, and that we're able to have you helping us today. Lewis, how are you doing? In uh, fine, it's it's uh, overcast and cold down here in the mid 20s, but uh, no precipitation uh, and none predicted for a while. So all the all the snow pa bypassed us. Oh, good, good. I guess I I'm hoping for more. Oh, well, sometimes I miss it. it. On. Sometimes I miss it. <laughs> so anyhow, today Lewis and I. Had some of our uh, viewers may or listeners may not know. I'm originally uh, from Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, it did, of course, snow up there and was uh, appreciably colder during the winter time. Yeah. Well, we managed to hit a record for January, coldest January, for a very long time here in New Jersey. <sighs> Bring on the snow. Uh, Lewis and I had started talking about this program some time ago because both of us are involved in providing quality assurance services, uh, Lewis, to his firm and as peer review, I believe, correct, Lewis? Yes, that's right. And I am involved in this primarily for our clients and actually got started providing the service at the request of a client. Uh, the way that it started was they called me up, they had a hotel project that they were working on that they were very nervous about because it was uh, an existing building that they were retrofitting as a hotel and essentially out of the 33 floors we probably had 26 different plans because the floor plate changed oh my word. every floor. So they were concerned about the coordination and asked us to help and that was really the start of it. They they truly appreciated the review comments that we provided and ultimately I think it gave them a better pro project once they got into construction. So that's, uh, Lewis, you can explain your, your local friendly <laughs> specifier <laughs> well, context here. How I got started in this was when I became a full-time specifier in 1982, I was working for a mid-sized firm, I think. <clears throat> 25, 26, 27 people, <clears throat> and they did not have a separate program for quality control reviews by somebody that wasn't working on the production team. And as I was going through the drawings in, uh, in what I thought was pretty good detail, I started noticing little things and I would mark them up and share them with the team, things that they had overlooked and, and missed. And, and uh, so that was where I got started in this business of, of looking at uh, drawings. That, and then um, in 1996, uh, the firm I was working for uh, wanted to get me involved in, I was working for a larger firm in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, the firm sent me and uh, one of our listeners on the uh, t on the call today, De Dennis Elrod, to a four-day course from the University of Wisconsin called or "This Really Trips Off the Tongue: Preparing Design Professionals and Owners to Detect Deficiencies in Working Drawings and Specifications." And uh, so uh, I've been involved in doing that ever since. And as David has said, not only internally, but in the last, uh, a couple of year before last, I did two uh, led teams doing two major peer reviews for clients uh, who wanted us to look at uh, documents prepared by another firm. Right. And after I did our first review and we started um, promoting the service actually, we had a client come to us and ask us to teach their staff 
how to do how to do <laughs> and the presentation I that we're using today is actually a modification of of that presentation yes and I've actually written an internal uh, document for our firm on how to perform uh, these kinds of reviews and as I said the, the the thing that prompted David and I is because if we're going to do a really good job as specifiers, we have to really look closely at the drawings. And we're going to see some things that the people who are producing the drawings just don't. As, a, as this quote from Charles Nelson's book, Managing Quality in Architecture, the person most likely to miss or an, an error or omission is the person who made the error or created the omission. And then... Uh, the other major problem that busy firms have is that they run out of time or and what that translates is they don't have somebody senior enough who can put in the time that it takes to do a truly detailed review. Well again, if we can help our project teams as specifiers by uh, communicating back to them what we find or don't find in the drawings, we can uh, truly uh, provide a value-added service that goes beyond just uh, writing specifications. Well, and the ran out of time uh, aspect of this too is sometimes just a matter of a commitment from a, at a management level to perform the review and making certain that you're budgeting the time yes. or scheduling the time. Absolutely. Uh, to be able to do the review. At my previous firm, <clears throat> the project managers were expected to uh, provide approximately one hour per sheet. And uh, there was a clear understanding that the principals in the firm who sealed drawings would not do so until the, the drawings had been through uh, a uh, quality control review. And who else here? We have this another quote from DPIC. Uh, thank you, Lewis, very much for providing this. Your friendly insurer, who is giving yes. you some guidance as to what architectural firms really ought to be doing. And as a matter of fact, when we, um, when they were came around to the office to kind of the underwriters, who figure out what uh, they're going to charge us for um, uh, insurance premiums. And I uh, spent an hour or so going through our, our uh, procedures for our quality uh, control reviews and so forth. Um, we got a, uh, an appreciable reduction in our premiums. So it can save money up front as well as after the fact. Yeah, and one of our firms, actually a larger firm, uh, Stantec, is an ISO 9000 certified uh, design firm. So these kinds of quality programs are instrumental to maintaining that ISO certification. Okay. So who is the first line of defense? Lewis hit on it a little bit. <laughs> There's no bias here either, is there? <laughs> no, 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 whatsoever. <laughs> and it's uh, really the specifiers, your first drawing reviewer. And and my pitch to our clients is that if I'm reviewing the drawings and can't understand it, there's no way that you should be able to expect the contractor to understand it. Because Absolutely. I'm on your side. I want this thing to work. <laughs> Absolutely. And you, and you probably know some of the background of the project even more than the contractor. So the contractors look at it very cold. And, and like Lewis is saying, we're doing the, the first pass review because we're there trying to search out what really is the design intent. What are all the materials? What are the systems? How do they come together? What are the transitions? Can we make it work? You know, what are all the parts and pieces that we have to cover? And I don't know, Lewis. Nitpicky, I don't <laughs> know that I would 
consider myself nitpicky. <laughs> But certainly get detail oriented. <laughs> and then about don't know about you, but uh, the drawing teams in my office have the fawning awe for me. So I've managed to bamboozle them into, into thinking I'm reasonably indispensable. Aha! Uh -huh. That's a great position. But we do have the technical knowledge to be able to uh, deal with things about products either not being installed correctly or being uh, used for the wrong effect. Okay, so but, Lewis and I have pulled together some examples, real examples, real projects, as to some really memorable kinds of misses that the design team had made. And all I can say is I am, I am thankful that we had an opportunity to review these because there could have been some really disastrous results. Uh, let me just tell you a little story about each of these and to explain the importance. Uh, the first one, where the architectural drawing showed the grade, the grade line drawn level, it was a very long building, and actually it was a sloping site, although it was a very gentle slope. Over the length of the building, it made a huge difference. At the far end of the building, we had pile caps two and a half feet out of grade, and the first step out of the stairwell for the exit was at least 18 inches. So major faux pas because they ended up having to redesign the footings to get them lowered and get everything into grade, and the stair was a major issue because of the room that was required to extend the run. What do you mean faux pas? Let's let's call a spade a spade. That was a blunder. Yeah, it was not a use blunder. euphemisms. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, Ann Baker has a, a quick comment. Uh, she says, unfortunately, this doesn't work if the specifier isn't is brought in uh, only two weeks before the project goes out the door. Oh, that never happens. <laughs> no, that never we, happens. Yes, we know that, Ann. <laughs> so. Well, then you can just get to ask all your questions, and they take care of it in the addendum. Yes. When I became a full-time specifier, the teams were a little startled that I started looking over people's sh shoulders in uh, um, schematics and, and asking pointed questions and prodding them into decisions. And eventually, they actually got to like that. <laughs> but it took a while for them to get used to the concept. You know, this next one, the elevators, actually the electrical engineer completely missed the high-rise bank of elevators in a hotel tower. And that one has some major implications. That one had me really nervous. So the first thing I saw, I didn't even wait, pick up the phone and call them and ask them to please confirm they at least had everything included in their calculations. Fortunately, they did. They just missed it on the drawings, which could have been some major cost if the contractor didn't pick up all of the uh, conduit and wiring. Uh, kitchen equipment. This one was unbelievable. The kitchen consultant actually had shown kitchen equipment installed inside the elevator shaft because it was available and because it was right next to the kitchen <laughs> and he needed more space. He needed more room. <laughs> all we had to do was find a way to run a flexible gas line to connect the oven. The uh, plumbing riser, when I checked one drawing, I, I must have spent at least an hour trying to figure out how this plumbing riser even related to the building. And I ended up calling the architect, and he says, don't you know it's for a different building? Unbelievable. And they were ready to issue this. Uh, David, read the uh, title blocks before you look at a drawing next time. No, no, they had the right title block. <laughs> oh. It was the wrong building. Wrong building. Uh, next one, they actually, on an especially tall uh, floor, they had three flights of stairs to get from floor to floor. Well, they missed a flight, which reversed the stair, which put okay. the door right behind a concrete beam, which left you about two feet of space to get crawl through the door to get into the stair. And the last one, my favorite, very high-end hotel is actually a casino hotel. The whole exterior wall is curtain wall. The mechanical engineer took the overflow roof drains and piped them through the curtain wall. 
and just let them spill down the face of the building. All right, Lewis, top that. <laughs> well, <coughs> I have a, the most memorable example of the first bullet is I looked at a drawing where the same material had three different designations or notes on one sheet that was drawn by one person. Uh, the next one was really astounding, a building, major building expansion joint running diagonally through a operating room and a hospital. They also had the same expansion joint running through doors and running underneath uh, base cabinets. Um, the next one is something that you see all the time and you just have to keep reminding people that about uh, condensation and needing vents to dry the stuff out. Um, the precast eyebrow, that was a, a BIM project. It was drawn in BIM, I should say. And, you know, it's possible to draw things that cannot be built. And they had t turned this eyebrow back against the, the curtain wall and didn't, hadn't figured out how it was going to stop against glass. And, of course, the last one is just something that you have to look for all, all the time. And also discontinuities in the thermal barrier and the air barriers. So what are the benefits of doing a quality assurance review? I, I, we have them in an order, but I would say the last point is the most important because if you get a repeat client, if your owner is happy with the result, nothing else really matters. So we can reduce the RFIs and addenda. Uh, actually, one, one project I had, we had... Um, no quality assurance review, no, no knowingly was done, and had over 800 RFIs before the contractor was out of the ground. Oh and my goodness! Of the ground. So if we can reduce any of those, and reduce change orders, you know, many owners are looking at the architectural and the design team's performance based upon not only the number of change orders, but the dollar value. And the, that perception sticks. One of the um, more disgusting things that has happened to me in my life is a, a principal in a large firm who fortunately is no longer with us. <coughs> uh, actually, uh, I was doing some quality reviews on the project that he was involved with. He says, oh, we'll catch that at RFIs. The problem is that there's a multiplier in effect. If I can fix it now, it's going to cost a whole lot less than to answer an RFI six months from now or a year from now or even, in, the, in that case, a year and a half from when the, the problem was discovered. Yeah, and it, the, the time required, because now you have to document everything once you get into RFIs or addenda and change orders, uh, the time escalates dramatically. And you have to research it because you, you're not going to remember why. Right. So some of the concepts to remember for quality assurance reviews. Use checklists. There are plenty of checklists out there. Uh, William Nigro uh, has a book that he wrote about quality assurance reviews called ReadyCheck. And he has an excellent checklist. We actually used that when we started uh, per, uh, providing the service ourselves. We've expanded and modified it, but it's a great start. Uh, we're going to show you some examples of why you want to do the rest of these things, but draw plans at the same scale. Show everything, the information only once. Put it in the right place. Geez, that's a CSI mantra. It's been around for a long time. Of course, uh, of course we realize that these uh, concepts that they on the screen right now are things that the drawing team needs to see <laughs> rather than us. But uh, if you have any influence with with your, whether you're an in-house specifier or an out-house specifier, uh, be sure and uh, try to encourage them and to uh, follow these these guidelines. Um, David, let's go to the next one that um, one of our. Okay. 
listeners, uh, Ron Lincoln sent in. Unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have been able to be with us today. And he um, very kindly, after seeing the announcement for the show, uh, for this session, um, sent in a couple of pages of things from his firm. And we just picked out a couple of the, the uh, more obvious things, or the more common things, I should say, uh, that we run into. And all of these items I would, <clears throat> under the do not use, I would categorize as red flag items. And when I go through a set of drawings, I have a magenta highlighter. And if I see one of these phrases, I flag it with magenta. Uh, so it stands out, so I, later I can check it out to see if it's true, because those vague cross-references, see, see mechanical, see structural, uh, most of the time are bogus. They're not true. Uh, and we, the one, wait, the, and the one, we've got to talk about C-specs, because everybody okay. knows <laughs> the specs we write are always perfect. So, of course, the information is going to be in the specs, and but there's really no reason to even say that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wayne Yancey uh, points out that um, he, has, there's a, he has a book that he's recommending, uh, Architectural Quality Control, an Illustrated Guide by Fred Nashed, or Nashed, AIA. I'm not familiar with that one, Wayne. I'll have to look that up. Okay, and keeping terminology consistent. Well, you already said you had the three different terms on the th same page. And you know, it's that that's yeah. just key. We'll talk more about that. Right. So who can be your reviewers? Actually anybody of in house staff and going back to the quote from DPIC, you might very well consider getting some of your more senior people to actually do the reviews. And I would I would encourage that only because a good deal of the review is seeing not necessarily what is there, but what is not there that should be. Ah, uh, yes, what I call the missing factor analysis. Yes, because if, if you don't have the experience and don't recognize that something is missing, it could be as equally as important, sometimes more important, than correcting something that may be uh, incorrect. And one of the things that we were hoping might come out of this uh, session today is to encourage our friends who know the secret handshake and belong to the same lodge to think about uh, additional career skills that you can develop to differentiate yourself and make yourself more valuable uh, to your firm or to your outside clients. Yeah, because as specifiers, we're already doing this. Really. Yes just to be able to write a specification. It's just taking the same skill set and applying it a bit differently. So, and it's not magic, it really is a skill. And incidentally, if there is some interest in David and I doing a session on kind of the actual mechanics of doing a comprehensive review where we look at all of the disciplines and not just the architectural uh, drawings that we're gonna write specs for, um, please let us know uh, if that would be of some value, and and we'll put that in. Uh, start thinking about it. And uh, Paul Gerber says, or equal. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you did that so well. <laughs> I say it frequently. Ah, okay. So here, here really is the problem. I'm sure you've all seen this kind of a production curve, and really it is all about the timing. QA does not need to wait until the end of the project. It does not need to start at 95%, because when you get to 95%, you do you really want to have something looking like this? Our office uh, encourages teams, it doesn't always happen, but to have uh, an independent review that we call readiness review at the end of schematics, at the end of CDs, and if it's a large complex project, uh, 
at least at least two reviews during CDs. It's a, I think it's a good policy because you're likely to catch some of these things, many of these things, before you get to that 95 percent. And it's much easier to coordinate earlier than later and to be able to get it right. Our friend Tommy Smith in Memphis has a, a uh, trenchant observation. He says, when a reference is indicated, like C structural, C mechanical, but does not actually exist, it is an identified omission for the opposing attorney. And that's true. That's an, it's an omission. That's a, Tommy's quite right. And uh, Paul Gerber says, uh, suggests that to invite your specifier to coordination meetings. And that's absolutely, uh, you know, a, a great idea. We need to, to spend more time with the projects up front learning about them. I'd settle for getting meeting minutes. <laughs> that's true, too. <laughs> so what is that funny-looking white box under the drawings there, David? Oh, Lewis, you're not that new to this business. <laughs> Okay. Here, here Listen, is I had to practically get an act of Congress to buy one of those when I got to this, the firm I'm with now. <laughs> here is everything that you need to do a review. Honest to gosh, it's everything you need. Uh, the primary tool that we're using really is markers, post-it flags, and the light box, the mystery item Lewis is asking about. And this one happens to be homemade, Lewis. I have, uh, two, of, I have two of these. Yeah, actually, so are, are ours. So it's not yeah, no. really magic. Again, you're just taking the drawings apart. You're doing, you're going through essentially building the project as though the contractor would build it, looking <laughs> for the things that are inconsistent, looking Hence for the mismatches. Plot. Hence the pliers, although David will often talk about uh, the difficulty of getting information out of project architects. is like pulling teeth. The pliers are really for pulling the staples. <laughs> yes, when the staple puller is not big enough. <laughs> we have a couple of comments. Uh, Larry Whitlock says, um, the first thing I check is the list of drawings with the drawings in the set, and then I make sure the reference codes are correct. I know projects that were designed by out-of-state firms that use their local codes and not the codes for the project location. Yes, I've run into that. As a matter of fact, uh, last year I checked a set of drawings and the civil engineer had stamped them with uh, his out-of-state seal and not the seal of the state where, where the project was going to be built. Um, Joel sometimes, Neen? sometimes just checking that drawing list is very telling. Yes, very as telling. What, as what to expect from the actual drawings, because if they can't get the names and the numbers right, you might already have a hint as to where the major problems are going to be. Joel Nimi has a really good comment. He says the key concept of lean construction, and I would add of uh, lean design, is reducing waste. Answering RFIs, or writing them for that matter, is wasted effort if the drawings could have shown things right before the bid. Think how much time is lost on other projects you're working on due to interruptions answering RFIs. It's very inefficient, Joel. You, we agree with you completely. <clears throat> uh, Larry asks, have either of you tried to check documents electronically yet? And the answer is yes, Larry. My firm uses New Forma, and we're going to show you some examples of uh, how I mark those up, and New Forma actually has a digital light table that you can take two documents and overlay them uh, and uh, manipulate the transparency, and the, 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 the two layers are assigned different colors to make it easy to see what's going where. So yes, you can throw the mechanical drawing on top of the architectural drawing and make sure they're, that the uh, the ducks are going through the, the chases. Yes. Uh, Bill Lewis Dubois has... wants to know what the star stamp is for, David. Oh, I'll take that one. Hi, Bill. Glad you could join us. The star stamp. I Because the drawings end up usually with so many comments on them, I'm looking for major hiccups, things that are 
really going to cost some money if it's not dealt with. And when I turn the review drawings back over to the design team, I, t I literally tell them, if you do nothing other than to address everything that is marked with that red star, you're probably 95% of where you need to be. Because at least then you've dealt with all the potential cost items. Uh, Mary, no we uh, forgive me if Mary if I'm mispronouncing your last name um, says another tool is the computer to write down comments uh, especially when you're you're doing a peer review one of the things that I did was um, number um, the comments that I put on the drawings were actually uh, numbers and then I put them into an Excel uh, spreadsheet just as a tabular form so that the owner could track the, the responses of the design team to those comments and uh, make sure that they were all addressed. Um, Wayne Yancey points out that the specifier is not the designer. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the distinction between what are the responsibilities that are uh, between the reviewer and the design team. And, uh, but we appreciate that input there, Wayne. David. Okay, so here we are. we're at the end, right? <laughs> are we at the end? No, now we get to go into the uh, war stories. Okay, all right. Real life examples. Yeah, Lewis and I have put together uh, some examples to show you. And Bill, here is the first example with the red star stamp. Okay, so here's here's a drawing that had a transformer vault. And if you look, the two notes are immediately next to each other. One saying the contractor is responsible for the work in the vault, and the other saying it's all provided by the local utility. So which one is it? And actually, if, if I could show you the next note sliding over <laughs> to the right on this, there was a third note that was assigning just the um, fluorescent lighting in the vault to the contractor. So it's really confused. Definitely a cost item. Big yeah. cost item. Yeah, it could be because the contractor could essentially exclude the the uh, transformer if that was uh, indeed the intent, it would have been okay, but if not, it could have been a huge cost item. Big change order and owners don't like big change orders unless it's a change that they initiate. That's correct. I'm going to try to get this here so we can large enough so we yeah. can see. Um, this is one that not only are we using different terms for exactly the same item, but it's it's also a waste because you know there's really no need to. T the contractor could care less whether we think it's a silt or a water table. It's architectural precast. That's enough. And um, the other thing that bothers me a little bit is I don't believe in noting things that are in bubbles that indicate an enlarged detail. Why waste time? Because that's not what this wall section is is going to be used for. Good point. Why pick out just that one item and label yeah. that and nothing else? And nothing else, yes. Oh, can I tell you my next? I, you're, yes. you're almost doing this. And I and I like whoever. Uh, oh, and this, this is. An, oh, by the way, this is an example of an electronic markup using, uh, you know, uh, marking uh, comments on PDFs with uh, the tools in New Forma, and the advantage is my firm is, a, of course, a multi-office firm, and so I can mark up things here in Nashville and one of our other offices can open up that same drawing uh, and access it and uh, all the members of the team can look at it and deal with it right away without me having to scan it or send it or anything like that. It's Everybody has direct access to the markups. Right. The one nice thing I really see on this is you're identifying the walls by type, the roof by type. Yes, rather, that is a positive. Yeah, rather than calling out all of the elements, because yes. presumably you have a 
wall type schedule somewhere that identifies all the parts and pieces. And a roof type schedule. Yes. Right. Yes, both of those things are very positive. Right. Uh, Dennis Elrod says that he is using uh, the new form of markup tool for just about everything these days, and he really loves it. Okay. Um, this is an example, one of the conventions that I use. You notice that I use green. I f have found over the years that green is a little, uh, has two advantages. One, it's a little more friendly for the people, m my victims, who have to uh, live with the stuff I send them. The other is it enables the, I don't want people to think that I'm doing the red lines. The red lines are the responsibility of the person who's going to seal the drawing. And that person should take my comments and say, yeah, let's do that, or no, let's not do that, or let's do it this way instead. Um, and so they should mark those comments in red. Uh, that's, I found that effective, but uh, there are all alternate ways to do it. Now, you notice here also that most of my comments are done in lowercase, but the one where it says fire resistive joint system, uh, <clears throat> the convention that we follow is that if I want people to change a, the wording of a note or add a note, it's in all caps, just the way it would be if the, it was drawn in CAD. Uh, other comments and questions are in the lowercase. Is, and is that effective, Lewis? Do you think that yes. that's well understood? And I, I always put a note at the beginning of the drawings and in the transmittal to remind people of, that that's the convention I follow, but it seems to work pretty well. Yeah, and I like your concept with green. I'm more a red in your face, make this or correct this drawing. <laughs> well, you do live on the East Coast. Well, that's true. I am a Jersey guy now, so. Whereas uh, I'm a Heartland kind of guy. Aha. Uh -huh. So I've been tainted, I suppose. <laughs> Here's one of the typical things. Again, uh, electronic markup. Um, we're uh, noting a discontinuity in a rated wall. It's just, that's, that's an important issue. And then also um, using new forma. Even you can actually scale things, even if they're not dimensioned, and find uh, where they're uh, mistaken. And in this case, I just had uh, at my fingertips, not between my ears, uh, the ADA reference, so I could refer the drafter to it and help them find it. Um, Wayne Yancey says he uses a three-color method. Uh, Wayne, you want to pick up the phone and tell us about that? And um, Larry Whitlock says that he uses green ink when marking up submittals. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, Wayne, pick up the phone. Let's tell us about your color system. Okay, well, we we're waiting for Wayne. Let's go to the next one. And since we're here on stairs, let's, I'm going to, let's just flip, flip this. Oh, I went the wrong way. Flip this around <laughs> so everybody can see. Uh, this is also about stairs, and you can see in trying to do a check, if you're looking at stairs and you're looking at the building egress, it doesn't just start and stop with the stairs. So here is information on the site plan and the grading, where actually this the grading at this terrace level compared to the finished floor elevation and compared to a detail that I'll show you, none of the stuff matches. So you really have to follow the comments through to make sure that you're getting everything coming together and making sure the entire thing is working. But it's, it's one of those things. Here's the stair of the egress out onto the terrace, door swinging out onto the terrace. There's a detail that shows the wall condition. And if that's a required exit, I notice that stair does not, that stair door did not open at 90 degrees. Uh, that, that's one item, yes, and here's the other. Let me <laughs> zoom in here. Yes, we have that 10-inch step from finish floor to grade or to the terrace. I and can't believe that somebody actually dimensioned that and thought they could get away with it. Yes, well, 
The, and if you go back and you look at the grades that are shown, I think it's actually more than 10 inches, but they dimensioned it at 10. So you just have to be careful that you're, you're looking uh, at the entire set. You can't just be looking at a single piece of the set. Uh, Joel Nemi has a comment on our marking colors. He says, green for submittal markups is handy. Most others will use red or blue, and the green can stand out as architect made this comment. Good idea, Joel. Interesting. Okay. I've got, I've got a couple of um, illustrations here just trying to describe what's missing. Here's a detail that we saw. It's an exterior curtain wall detail at a column surround. And it might be a little bit difficult at this scale. Let me zoom in so that now that you have the idea of what's missing. So we have the aluminum framing, the glass wall, the aluminum exterior cladding around the insulation. And we move inside. And what do we see? Exposed yeah, insulation. Exposed sheathing, exposed stud, there's no closure. What my mother would have called gaposis. Yep, yep. So, yeah, it's the magic gap here. Somebody's not going to notice it. And depending on what that insulation is, if it's foam, it could be a serious problem. You've got foam exposed to the interior without... Which is a code uh, violation. Yeah, just a little. As well as being practical. Thing. Right. And this, this is a kind of a thing as specifiers going through trying to find out what the detail and what to specify, we're going to see. And, we'll, and I would comment on this to the design team even before it got to the 95%. All right. So here's one. What do you see as a problem here? This, this is a safety railing at near a roof edge to keep people away from the roof edge. And the biggest issue I see is really that it's the mounting plate is being welded to the metal decking. Now metal decking is there to support the roof surface, but certainly not designed to take the moment load that it would be for a safety railing. Uh, no. Yeah, do you think? There's also the issue of, is the heat shrink rubber really compatible with bituminous roofing? And can you t run the bituminous roofing up around a pipe or column or pipe post? Uh, well, that's another issue. Or the aluminum flashing over the steel pipe. <laughs> okay. Take your pick. All right. Here's another one. You like the red flags, Lewis. So have you got some suggestions here? So, all right. We'll zoom in a little bit. Aluminum flashing direct to concrete. This concrete blob circumventing whatever insulation they put in the roof. And who knows how they're going to ever re-roof this without tearing the wall off since it's a single piece flashing. Yes. And if it's not, and if the aluminum isn't painted, it'll disappear pretty quickly when in contact with the concrete. And there's no way to tie off the roof, the base flashing mechanically at the top of that concrete curb. Yep. Just, just a few minor problems. Hey, Dave and Lewis? Yes. This is Matt. I'm, I'm going to unmute Wayne's line, uh, see if yeah, that great. works. So, um, let's see. Um, actually, Wayne, it looks like with you being on the phone, you have to enter the data pin so I can unmute you. Um, so it should be star and then whatever number just popped on your screen and then star again. If you want to keep going, guys, I'll pop okay. in if I get Wayne unmuted. All right, the next example we have is just trying to coordinate some of the legends and the materials uh, that should be specified and how it's easy 
easily or could be easily overlooked. So here we have limestone veneer. We'll go back to our stair example. Remember this one with the 10 inch. Okay, so they've labeled this out as the stone dash one. And this is one that it's such a small area, this is the only place on this particular job that this stone veneer actually occurs. <laughs> it was probably a last minute thought as to how to finish the concrete at this stair condition and terrace. So here we have the stone and called out on the drawings and absolutely and not any And your NF not means not, not found. Not found. And I sometimes use DNF with. or did not find. Yeah. And CW is coordinate with. So here, coordinate with that detail. There's no stone veneer and it's not covered in either of these masonry sections. How'd you do, Matt? Were you able to get Wayne on? Uh, Wayne, you should be unmuted. So if we can see okay, if you can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, good. Hey, it's good to talk to you guys. Well, glad um, to have you, Wayne. Uh, the three-color marking method was something I learned from the book I talked about, Architectural Quality Control and Illustrated Guide. I, I've come across so much information on, uh, other than the um, ReadyCheck book, on quality control and quality assurance, but nobody really broke it down to show you how to do it. So basically the three-color method is yellow, blue, or yellow, red, and blue. The yellow, uh, as you walk through the drawing, signifies that the words and numbers are correct and, and everything is checked. The red is used to make corrections to wrong information like everybody does traditionally and it draws attention and uh, the advantage is that it draws attention includes reasons and suggests remedies in blue. And the blue pen, I use that to ask questions, make comments and suggestions and um, color different, the different color prevents uh, the comments from being mistakenly included in the drawings, reduces the perception that the checker, the checker is not nitpicking and trying to find fault with everything. And in addition, uh, questions may not, may open the eyes to the team to potential problems, like do not, and I, we always say, I have a, a, a label I put on the first sheet of the set that explains my uh, terminology and my methodology. So, uh, and part of it, you know, when when a young person who's, you know, kind of a grunt draftsman and they see just blood, blood all over the place, uh, they get intimidated. So if you can use the blue to kind of uh, give the impression that uh, not everything that they're reading is, a, is an error or a mission or a whatever, uh, they, they won't feel discouraged and uh, feel that I'm a nitpicker. Very good. Thanks, thanks, Wayne. Uh, and and, uh, yeah, it's an excellent comment. Thank you. So this is a really good book. It's uh, I, I sent some. I put some information online there in the comment box about it. it's a McGraw Hill book. So if you go to www.books.mcgraw-hill.com, you'll find that it's uh, it's fifty nine ninety five USA, and for Paul it's seventy nine ninety five. <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> Yeah, he's probably freezing his ass up there. I know it's been cold in Canada. Somewhere I have an old uh, book about doing these uh, checks, and it has an elaborate multicolor system, and it's insanely complicated. It's it's almost funny. It's so complicated, but uh, that's a lot more. That's a lot more reasonable. Oh, and Paul types in a comment, uh, the joys of being Canadian. Yeah, yeah, especially with the dollar these days. It's down again. <laughs> I'll send the, um, a, a PDF of the three-color marking method through to you guys so you can uh, maybe uh, broadcast it to some of the other members. Sure. Uh, and uh, I, I use the term AVW, at variance with. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's what Bill Nigro suggests, too. And I just found... You know, maybe it's me, maybe it's my handwriting, but the V's and the W's tend to run together, and then you get folks asking, well, what is this? Is it <laughs> A-W-V, A-V-W, A-W-W? Yeah, I so, like Lewis's um, 
uppercase, lowercase differentiation. I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, I like the fact that he didn't repeat himself twice. He referred to previous comments, like say it once, say in the most logical place, and then carry on from there. Right. One of the things that I do when uh, I was working for Morrison Hirschfield, which was a building science group, and we reviewed a lot of drawings. So my first step is to walk through the drawings and look. First of all, I look for all the um, references to make sure that the reference that they put on the plans to a section or whatever is actually in the section sheets. And I and then I walk through and I look for all the partition types, the wall types, to make sure they use them all. And usually you find out that the partition types, I've got about 10 placeholders and only use three. You know, So it, it always generates a possibility of an RFI saying, well, where are these walls? Um, and a lot of things I find are that the when the drawings are being built, they're basically saving ads from a previous project and um, filling the, the building or the drawings with a lot of placeholders with products that don't occur. And then, so you know, you get your you do your due diligence and you do your your takeoff like you're a contractor, only to find out a month later that well that's not in the job. So we, they they cause us to spin our wheels a lot. Right. It can happen. And even as a specifier, because I know that I'll pick up a set of drawings and you, and one of the things you just commented on, you look at a schedule thinking that it's complete and represents the project, but you start diving into it and all of a sudden you discover that, no, it's not. It doesn't even match the project. And it was probably pulled over from a separate or another project and never really updated or wasn't updated yet. Uh, David, I think we're <coughs> getting close to our time. We need to move on. We are. That's very good. I think this example here is, is fairly obvious. Let's go on to the next one. All right. Um, here's a kind of a typical coordination aesthetic thing, you know. Is the, site, or is the difference in sight lines going to be acceptable? Let's go to the next one. <coughs> uh, there's always a problem these days with what gets dimensioned on structural drawings and what gets dimensioned on architectural drawings. If you got a slab recess, the structural guys are probably going to rely on the architects to dimension that recess. Let's, let's go to the next one. I think this one's your favorite, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I like this one. We're um, our firm is starting to do some uh, what we call drawing and in uh, context and showing some uh, axonometrics on one sheet. This same sheet also has the plans and vertical sections through some of these items, including that bridge section that we saw earlier. And so um, it actually gave me an opportunity to help clarify the issue that they weren't showing the route of the building expansion joint at the end of the bridge that connected two wings of the building. Um, and uh, so there I used a red for the, the drawing just to make it to stand out from the, the green comments. And you notice that some of my comments, like the one at the top, are uh, often phrased in the form of question. Again, the, it's a little less uh, in your face than, uh, did you really mean to do this? Can we go to the next one? Sure. But yeah, I like that one. And here's an example using New Forma where not only uh, can I make my own uh, nasty comments, but I can actually import from uh, the internet uh, a manufacturer's uh, detail is instead of me trying to resketch it, I can show them while well, here, draw it like this. And I, in this case, I even uh, attached uh, the name and phone number of the rep for one of the companies that makes these things. And that's got to simplify their life in going back ultimately in in um, making the corrections. And um, you notice my red flag down here, the one hour rated steel design pending. Down here. I'm not sure what they meant by that. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to your uh, PowerPoint and kind of wrap things up. I think there's another slide. So uh, what we're looking for, <coughs> teams need, is 
is an objective look. And, and all of us have our little personal preferences and hang-ups. And so we need to really try to see what the drawings are actually communicating in a, an objective way. And if remembering that there's more than one way to skin a cat, and people may not do it the way we like it, but hey, if it's going to work, it'll work. And if it doesn't, we can point that out. Right, cause one, one of the things I find in making the presentations, because usually at the end of each review, we'll make a presentation to the entire design team, you, you never know how they're going to receive it. Yes. Uh, that's part of the problem. And be, staying objective rather than accusatory certainly helps. Never write a comment with an exclamation point at the end. Correct. Because I have had it, the reviews received both ways. One uh, being that they're very positive, very thankful, appreciative of the comments, knowing that we're there trying to help. And then you have the absolute opposite, where they're very defensive about what they've done, thinking that you're criticizing uh, their work as opposed to trying to help to make it better. So it, it is important to stay objective. And so for all you specifiers out there, look for things other than just products that you can really make some valuable contributions to your project teams. Uh, looking for missing information, uh, one of my favorite lines in any movie is where the dwarves in uh, Time Bandits run into this uh, uh, invisible force field and one of them says, oh, so that's what an invisible force field looks like. <laughs> and, um, and getting back to uh, one of the, uh, Wayne's comments about responsibility, our primary duty is just to raise the consciousness level, to raise issues. The design team can usually solve them if they don't need, if they need some help, we can always do that, offer that later. We don't have to solve the problems, we just need to say, mm, this is, this, this may not work, you know, think about this one, or let's talk, or something like that. Um, we don't have to go to a great lot of detail to, to redesign the, the projects for them. And then um, uh, one of the things that we can do, not associated directly with a, a review or even producing a set of specs, is to work with your office and uh, and with the younger folks and, and teach them how to note drawings because that's something they don't learn in school. So look how easy it is. <laughs> really. Other than this being a few pounds ago, it is all that easy. So we are on the hour and we really appreciate you joining uh, joining us today and we want to invite you back for March which will be the first Thursday again March 6 same time same place and Lewis and I will be coming up with uh, a subject for March we can tease you for April we already have a guest host lined up uh, Yuzhaval Vias and we're going to have him do an encore presentation of uh, something that he is presenting to the CSI Academies. Um, <clears throat> uh, Larry Whitlock has a suggestion that we might want to talk about using AI doc AIA documents D200, project checklist, and G612 for requesting information from the owner and the uh, uniform location document. So those are the kinds of suggestions we want to see. Is, you know, David and I really want this to be useful to all of us. And so if there's something that's bothering you or that you could, you know, that or that where you have some special insights that you could contribute, please keep those cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors. Okay. So thank you very much. Enjoyed having you all and enjoyed the uh, participation today.